Welcome to the Radical Lifestyle Podcast, brought to you by Generation to Generation, where you will be inspired by the past, equipped for the present, and prepared for the future, as we engage in conversations with people from around the world. Hello everyone, this is Andrew and Daphne from Generation to Generation, and our guest today is Becky Murray. Becky, for people that don't know who you are, can you just say a bit about where you're from and what you do? Sure, I am honoured to be with you today. My name is Becky Murray and I'm the founder and CEO of a charity called One by One. I'm from the very north of England originally, uh, but now live very central England. But I apologise for my northern accent. We will do subtitles for anyone who struggles. (laughs) (laughs) No, don't promise that. That's a lot of work. Okay, if they we'll don't pray, understand, we'll pray for those sorry. who don't understand. Yeah, lean into the spirit, he <laughs> can translate for you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for people that listen to this and they want to find out more about you, maybe support in some way, um, where can they do that? So we have a charity website, which is onebyone.net. Um, and then we're also on social media, all the different platforms. I would love to say Twitter, but I'm terrible at Twitter. So maybe let's just stick to Instagram or Facebook. But yeah, you can find us on there. You've got to be really brave to venture into the world of Twitter. Um, I I keep forgetting. My my husband loves Twitter and he keeps telling me to tweet, Um, but I I forget. So I go in stages where I'll do two in a day and then I won't do any for about three months. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, yeah, if you want to go check those out, those will be in the description box. So the links are there for you to go on. And it's O-N-E by O-N-E, not W-O-N or any combination of that. No, absolutely yes. not. O N E B Y O N E dot net. <laughs> one by one dot net. So, okay. So, for people who know nothing, let's start at where we are today and then let's go back to how you came to be in this position. So, what is one by one? So we are an organisation that seeks to end exploitation of the vulnerable around the world. We run a big base in Kenya, which comprises of a residential unit for 200 kids. Uh, We also run primary school, secondary school, church, medical centre. It's almost a village within the village now. And then lots of teenager homes as well as. And then we also run a big base in Pakistan uh, where we are rescuing children out of slavery. So kids that have been born into brick kilns, we are pulling them out of the factories and we have a safe house out there. And then in addition to that, we actually still work in the brick factories. So our commitment was until we can get all the kids out of slavery, we will commit to going in. So we have teams of people that go into 50 brick factories every single week, bring in hope and love and the joy of Jesus. Well, I think I've just got you another um, comrade in the battle. You probably don't know, but Andrew's sister heads up our anti-human trafficking organisation called Operation Open Eyes. Oh, wow, okay. So after this is over, I need to link you up with her because she will be really really on board with what you're doing yeah and, and anxious- we are super passionate about human trafficking and in fact you probably know but it's human trafficking awareness month right now yeah and so we are really passionate about that we run a, a project called the dignity project that's actually all about human trafficking and going into schools we've reached about twenty thousand girls now with that uh, teaching them all about human trafficking and then also equipping them so that they can stay in school every month okay we'll talk about that after the podcast all right but, sounds um, good <laughs> so we now know what it is Let, let's go back in time how did you come to be in this place or what, what led you into it Where, what were you doing take us on a bit of a journey okay so I always had a heart for uh, missions um In fact, my mum tells me stories of being a tiny little girl and telling her, I'm going to be a missionary in Africa. And my mum being like, of course you are, darling. Like, we didn't have anybody in our family background who was in full-time ministry even, let alone missions at the other side of the world. And um, that something was in me as a tiny little girl. And I honestly believe, you know, when the Bible talks about God shaping us in our mother's womb, and we're so good at interpreting that in terms of the physical flesh and bones, But I genuinely believe that God is literally, his fingerprint is instilled upon us as he is shaping and molding us. And his plans and purposes are set out right from our mother's womb. And so even as a tiny child, God's imprint upon my life was clearly there. 
Um, but it was actually many years later. You know what it's like when you're a teenager? You think you know everything that's going to happen in your life. And I'd said I was going to be a solicitor. I was super passionate about injustice mm. and thought I would fight it through law. And um, little did I know how I would end up fighting it in a very different way in my life. Um, but it was around the age of 18 that I started going speak to me really strongly about running a children's home which was never at all on my agenda you know you meet some people who are totally like kid type people they're the larger than life people there you walk in a room and they're the loudest person in the room well that wasn't me I wanted to be a solicitor like I was Mrs organized and neat you know not not at all kid type person but sure enough, God knows it's better than we know ourselves. And the kids that are in the care of one by one are literally just the biggest joy in my life. They have become my greatest teachers in what it is to look like Jesus Christ. And now working with thousands of kids around the world, little did I know that I was born for this. Um, and so it was actually on a missions trip. I got on a short term mission trip with my local church back in 2006, but my life was totally changed. And I met a little girl living on the streets and she was a nine year old called Felicity and she simply didn't have any shoes. So I bought a pair of little pink flip flops from the supermarket and it wasn't it wasn't any big act of generosity. It was an insignificant moment or so I thought by of these 50 pence flip flops. Well, that evening, Felicity approached me and she said, Becky, should I wait in your hotel room? And I was like, no, we're literally just heading out. We were doing this big gospel campaign in the city. And I was like, no, we're heading out. You can come with us. And she said, yes, but shouldn't I wait in the hotel for you? Now, if she'd have asked my husband or any of the guys on the team, I would have known what this little girl was asking. But I remember thinking she can't possibly be asking another girl what I think she is. So I asked her a third time and sure enough, she thought I'd spent 50 pence on her so I could have her body and she was willing to give it. And in that moment, Daphne, my heart was literally scarred, but in a good way in terms of nothing can quite prepare you for the moment when a kid looks you in the eye and thinks you deserve their body for 50 pence. And I made a vow to God that day that I'll give my life to this, even if it's only ever for one child, hence calling the organization one by one, even if it's only ever for the one, I'll give my life to this. Wow. You know, I, I remember it reminds me of Jesus saying, in, the, in as much as you've done it into one of the least of these, you've done it unto me. Yeah. Um, he said, and to one of the least of me is my brethren, which is also the Jewish nation, but you've done it unto me. And, and I think of Matthew 18 and how the sins against children are a kind of the worst they are. I really, I mean, when we're speaking, we say um, that there isn't another sin where you're told to go and commit suicide if you do it. Mm. You know, a bit of millstone round your neck and jump into the sea. So how did it, how did it, talk to us about the progress of it. I mean, you didn't just suddenly wake up one morning and say, I'll give my life to it and here it all is and we're on a massive <laughs> roll. You've come on. That was how you caught your heart, but how did it roll out? Yeah. So, as I say, God initially spoke to me when I was 18, and so that changed the course of my life. Instead of going on to university and doing law, I ended up going into nursing because uh, I knew that that would be critical for the mission field. Um, but I remember coming home from that trip as an 18-year-old and telling everybody in my world, the saves the Lord. I'm going to run a children's home. And I think in my naivety, because God had said it today, it would obviously happen tomorrow or the day after, or at least next month or, well, at least this year, right? And I think, think sometimes the challenge for us as Christians is when we've got a promise in our heart or we know that we know that we've heard God in a certain area, we expect it to happen in our timing. And I think of the likes of Abraham and Sarah who have this promise from God of a child 
year after year is passing by and nothing's happening. And so man's great wisdom, we think, okay, God, let me help you out. And all we end up doing is creating Ishmael's in our lives. And I was determined to wait for Isaac. I didn't want to create an Ishmael. Uh, we can sometimes do very good things, but it's not necessarily the God thing in our life, is it? Mm -hmm. And um, so I went on a journey of 13 years of waiting for the fulfillment of the promise. And in that 13 years, I just committed to serving my employer while serving my local church while. And that's what led me on the local um, mission trip, the, the short term missions trip, sorry, with my local church. And so I just wanted to help serve other people you know, serve other people in their callings and then the door will open for you. And in the meantime, you're learning from them. And so I had the joy of spending about a month out in Colombia working with street kids with a missionary who's from Hull. And then I also had the joy of spending three months in Mozambique with a lady called Heidi Baker, who does a phenomenal work out there. And just learning from other people who are already involved actively in world missions, um, serving them and learning from them. And because of the faithfulness, I ended up being in the right place at the right time. Um, so I was in another short term missions trip to Kenya in 2009. And I remember before going out, I felt God speak to me as strong as the day he did when I was 18. And he said, now's the time, look for land. And so I remember my first day in Kenya, we were doing big gospel campaigns again with the evangelist that I was volunteering with. And I met with the, the local pastor who'd helped to set up the big gospel campaign. I knew he was a good man. He oversaw many different churches who were very apostolic and just a good, great guy. And I began to share my heart with him. And I remember seeing tears welling up in his eyes. And he said, Becky, I've just been given a plot of land. It's yours. And so I went out there on the Sunday uh, back in 2009 and saw what was just a field at that point uh, in a little village called Bumala B. It's literally in the back end of nowhere. Like I speak to Kenyans who don't even know where Bumala B is. And uh, it's literally mud huts and then our base. Um, but it's become my second home. Wow. Well, we, um, people often ask us how our ministry started and we haven't a clue. We just found ourselves in the middle of it. Um, but I said to Jesus one day, can you tell me how we got to where we are we've been to over 40 nations I mean Andrew and his sister have grown up traveling the world and all that come and so I said to him can you can you please tell me because people keep asking and I don't know and he said this and, and I think this applies to you he said it's quite simple Daphne you just kept saying yes absolutely and I hear that with you I say yes to serve my local church I'll say yes to go and I'll say yes and and if we just follow the yes Jesus knows where that's taking us to so yeah that's really so resonate with very that. often people might hear God say you know I want you to do this thing um and then it's like well okay well I'll wait I'll wait for you to to do, to bring this thing about uh, and so they kind of just wait and wait and wait and wait and nothing happens. And um, But with you, you heard, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Don't know when or how that's going to happen. So you, it's like you just went, well, okay, well, I'm going to get all these experiences that I can until yeah. that happens that will prepare me for what's coming. Whereas maybe if you had have just said, you know what, I'll wait for this to happen. Maybe you would still be waiting now because you hadn't got all those experiences along yeah, the way. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's this balance of waiting on God so that it's an Isaac you're walking into and not an Ishmael. But at the same time, there is, I heard Reinhard Bonnke come out with this amazing quote that God runs with runners. He doesn't sit with sitters. And there's such a truth in be faithful today. What, what has God put in your hands right now today? What can you do today to bring the kingdom of heaven to us? And if every single day we have that mindset of being faithful today and saying yes to God in the here and now, even in the small decisions, in the unseen moments, that's often where then the huge doors open. A friend of mine says um, big doors open on very small hinges. And it's so true. If we're just faithful in the unseen, we then walk into the destiny of exactly what it is God's 
that God's got for our lives. And trusting him with the yes, really, because often the yes can be accompanied by a lot of buts. Yeah. I mean, so, but I've got a house, but I've got family, but I've got this, but I've got that. And one of the things we say is, uh, God doesn't need you to remind him of that when he asked you. I mean, he, he's kind of got this all down. You can just say yes. Like you expect him to go, oh, thanks for reminding me. Let yeah. me go find someone else. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, let me just <laughs> let me just go start that point. No, it's so true. I remember obviously saying yes to God about the, the piece of land in Kenya. And it was all exciting when I'm being given a plot of land. That was all amazing. But I remember the sudden reality check moment of being given the bill for the architects of the the building of how much it would cost to build this huge center that we have and i we didn't run a big organization at that point in fact we didn't have charity status at that point we didn't become an official charity until 2011 so in 2009 i'm just some random girl with a heart for god but no big organization no website no charity like nothing was in place I remember getting this bill and it was for £150,000. Now, in typical African style, it ended up being more than that. Um, but the initial bill was for 150000 But it may as well have been for a million because I think we had about one or £2,000 saved up at that point. And it had taken me years to save that one or £2,000. And suddenly I've got this bill for 150000 And it's in those moments that the enemy can come and whisper did God say are you sure it's God are you sure it's not just you is this really God because if it's not you're gonna look really foolish right now in those moments will we still say yes because it's those moments where it's tempting to lay the dream dream the promise down and say well I just can't do this it's too big it's too hard but because of the felicity moment of the little girl with the shoes she became what I call my non-negotiable moment up until felicity I'd got this exciting promise from God. It was all wonderful. It's all dreams and brilliant. But if my life had become challenging or circumstances had become too difficult, I could have easily laid the dream down and said, well, I'll lay it down for now and I'll pick that back up in the future. But the day I met Felicity, she was my non-negotiable moment. It was a no going back. I have to run with this no matter what. And so holding this bill, sensing the lies of the enemy of did God say just like he did with Eve back in the garden he uses the same tactics did God say you sure God said and it's in those moments where we still run with a rest, yes cry because if we will on the other side of our yes are miracles that God in, and only God can do miracles of transformation miracles of provision miracles of healing and all kinds of wonders if we would just say yes Do, um, I, f I feel like daniela should be here. It's not, i'm going to be telling her stories but just like you have a girl she has a girl called the girl in red um who is her anchor point her anchor point and how she kept going back and seeing that that when she was first um, taken into sexual exploitation, what she was like, and then she saw her again, the deterioration, how she went back, you know, and eventually she said um, it didn't, it had progressed from it owning her to her owning it. And and so it was. it's those moments and so she has her girl in red just as you have your girl that holds on wow. so I think too you know obviously in different ways we we have the financial challenges in what we yeah. do and I know what held me at the beginning even before the ministry really took off somebody said to me Daphne never make finances the reason to say yes or no True. And that has really been our anchor all these years. We've been going now for over 30 years. That has been our anchor all, all these years to just say yes and find out about the finances afterwards. It's like, I don't think we ever say, what will it cost? Yeah. As a sort of a protection. Yeah. I think <laughs> another thing as far as finances is concerned, as people are listening, faith 
and believing God, where we're concerned, does not include debt. Mm. It's like one of the conditions that we have of people if they come as a, an intern or anything is that they come debt free. Um, so I think that whole area requires integrity and yeah. focus and solidity uh, and a, a total trust in God because it's all out of our hands. Absolutely. We say we have a hard enough time believing in him to provide for the future without having to worry about him providing for our past as well. <laughs> yeah. so, Absolutely. So, okay, we, we digress at these various points. So you've got this plot of land and you've got the bill. What yeah. next? So within the space of a couple of years, every single penny came in and some of it was miraculous, literally checks in the post. Some of it was little old ladies in our local church put, giving 10, 20 pounds here and there saying, put that towards your work, honey. And um, it was amazing really to watch God at work because in that same year, my own little boy was born and he was extremely poorly. So that whole year of 2011, we spent the entire year in hospital having major surgery after major surgery with my own baby. And yet in my year of greatest weakness, God brought in every penny that we needed so that we could open the home on the 12th of the 12th of the 12th. That's an anniversary that even I can remember. I have a goldfish memory, but the 12th of the 12th of the 12th is a day even I can remember. And we started with 42 kids and now we have over 200 on our site in Kenya. And then we also do a school project in Kenya that reaches about 10,000 kids every week. Wow. That, that is so close to the heart of God. It is so close to the heart of God. So talk to us about the type of children that you have and perhaps tell us a few stories. Okay. So... My kids in Kenya, I say this all over the world, but they genuinely have become my greatest teachers because the kids that we are involved in and helping with have gone through every kind of abuse you can imagine, like sexual, physical, neglect. Um, you know, I remember reading the social workers report for some of these kids and words like starvation and torture were coming upon the reports. And for someone who's come from a beautiful family where she was cherished by her mom and dad, I remember reading these reports thinking, where in the world do we even begin? And I felt the Holy Spirit just say, whisper, love them back to life. And so we began to do that. We just loved on these kids and get, obviously gave them a home, gave them an education, a great diet, medical care. Um, but it was as they just started to realize that they're loved, that they're cherished, that they have a heavenly father who knows everything about them and adores them and has this incredible plan for their lives, that they suddenly began to blossom. And now the kids that are in our home, people can't even believe the background that they came from because they don't carry the scars. They don't walk around with open wounds. These kids are healed. And as a result, we go round the village with our kids. Some of our kids will lay hands on the sick in our village and have seen them healed many times. And small children are then leading our village people to Christ and saying, well, you know, it was God that healed you, not me. It was Jesus that did it. And they begin to share the gospel of Jesus. And it's just been amazing to watch God at work in these kids' lives. But I remember some of them, one of my, uh, one of the kids in our care is called Shaddy. I'll use his nickname just to protect his identity, but Shaddy as I, as I call him. And Shaddy's dad was polygamous. Polygamy is a huge thing in, in a rural part of Kenya. And so his dad had three wives. And sadly, his dad passed away. His dad was a good man, but he passed passed away and I think Shaddy was only a tiny at this stage maybe five maybe six and um, the two of the mums decided that actually if they could kill off Shaddy's mom they'd have a bigger plot of land to share between the two of them and so they did they they stoned her <laughs> to death but in front of Shadrach in front of Shaddy and um, he then was being brought up until we came along was being brought up by his mum's murderers and when I say brought up you can imagine what that looked like um, and so Shadi had a big brother who became his hero his big brother was the one to take care of him and his little brother 
Um, they've lost mom and dad at this stage. And so the big brother was the hero. And he would rear some chickens in order just to supply them with some more food to get some eggs. But the chickens kept going missing. And so one night the big brother laid a trap and he sat awake to see what was going on. And all of a sudden discovered that one of the family uncles was stealing the chickens. So the big brother challenged the uncle. You know, I've got so little and you're taking the bit I've got. What are you doing? And he challenged him. And in a fury that the nephew had, an odd, had the audacity to challenge him, he picked up the machete. They, a lot of people in, in Kenya have their own farms. They call them shambas. It's their own little plot of land where they grow their own food. And so many times they have huge machete style knives to chop down the maize. And he picked up the machete and went to attack the brother. Um, cut his neck mercifully the big brother survived and the uncle got put in prison but on the day the uncle was released from prison he went into shaddy's mud hut at night and murdered his big brother so shaddy's witnessed his big brother and his mom murdered he'd lost his dad at a little age so by the time we took shaddy in he was an incredibly broken little boy um he would often wet the bed at night he was living constantly in fear that him or his little brother the only surviving member of his family would be attacked or hurt and it took years and years of breaking down the wall with shaddy just loving on him and today the man that i now have the joy of calling my friend who's grown up with us for the last decade this year is now in college is studying to be an engineer and he's doing, he's grown in his confidence. He's doing incredibly well. He's passionate about Jesus. He serves in his local church next to the college where he now attends. And the boy that I see today is completely worlds apart from the boy I took in a decade ago. And watching Jesus just begin to work transformation in these kids' lives and then watching the children watching how they've responded. I've had some kids who've been abused by their own parents. But after finding the love of Jesus Christ and being healed through Jesus, they now want to take the gospel back to the very people who used to abuse them. And I watch that and it challenges me of, would I be so gracious? But, you know, we all talk about forgiveness and forgiveness is easy to talk about until you've got to do it. And then it's incredibly difficult. But I watch these kids walk in a level of forgiveness that challenges me to my core. And so when I say they've become my teachers, I really mean it. Mm. I remember in Indonesia, um, there was a group, a group of children whose parents had all been um, martyred. Really, they were all killed because they were Christians. Um and these children, that I was asked to pray for these children. And I kind of froze. And I was like, uh, I think they need to pray for me. Um, but I received my rebuke at that time. And I've never refused to pray for anyone since then. They said, can you not pray for them? Anyway, these children were serving the Muslims that had killed their parents. They were They were loving on them they were taking them food they were serving them they were wow. singing praises to jesus very similar to what you're saying and this was about three o'clock in the afternoon that i met them i could not stop crying at midnight i mean i was heaving like my insides were going to <laughs> i could start again were going to come out it, it they're I'm just saying this to identify with what you're saying, that there aren't words, really. It's holy ground when you, um, when you come in contact with what God is doing amongst mm. children, young people, or adults come to that and bring about reconciliation in ways that you could never organise it. Absolutely. I've got another yeah. story. Um, well, uh, before oh, yeah. you do... Um, and this is a, an ongoing thing, I'm sure, as you get exposed to situations and stories along the way. Um, uh, even, you know, for, for us, uh, recently being involved with rescuing people from Afghanistan and the, the things you get exposed to in doing things like that. Um, for you, 
you're an eight, uh, how old did you say you were? You start to see these reports of people, you know, these oh. horrendous things they were you going don't through. Don't ask a woman. Her. I no, was she did just say, she just say, say, she just said, ask me how old I am. <laughs> I cannot believe that. At the time, I know, at the time, terrible. you were much younger. <laughs> well, maybe not much younger. Okay, I'm digging a hole here. <laughs> yeah, you anyway, are certainly digging here. Yeah. Uh, someone's going to have to give me a ladder in a minute. Um, <laughs> you said uh, you were, how old you were? <laughs> You said how old you were when you started to see these reports. You first kind of exposed to the, the the stuff yes. these people had all gone through. Um, so the kid, yeah, the kids I take care of in Kenya. I was thirty when I started. It. Okay, so you know, you said you know this is like a whole other world. You were suddenly exposed to as you were re- reading these reports. Yeah. Um, how did you deal with that yourself? I mean, you've got to care for these people that are, are coming your way. But it can also take a massive emotional uh, and mental toll on the people caring for them. So uh, what was that like for you as you walked through that journey then uh, and maybe even now as you continue to get exposed to some of these situations? Yeah, I think sometimes the the situations we face and it, it's not just myself and we've got a team of incredible people. So I've got 40 staff in Kenya who are just total heroes and then 26 staff in Pakistan who again are literally day in day out putting their lives on the line to do the work we do out there um but every single day for all of our staff and for myself the importance of depending on Christ you know we can't do this in and of our own strength but what we do try and do is when challenging situations come we try and use that as a tool rather than becoming so overwhelmed that we retreat we try and focus that as to even a deepening as to why we're doing what we're doing and to run harder and faster so an example of that is just last year where obviously you guys will be in a similar situation where you're carrying a global organization through a global pandemic it comes with challenges And so I remember last year, I'd lost many different sponsors because of people being made redundant with their jobs due to the pandemic. And this challenging moment of, I've got hundreds of kids in my care and almost 80 staff. And I felt this weight of responsibility all of a sudden and um, donors pulling out because they're made redundant. And all of a sudden in my humanity, um, fear began to rise. And so I came up with a great master plan I told God, error number one, when you tell God, but anyway, I told God my big master plan for one by one would be to batten down the hatches to ride out the storm. So I wasn't going to start any new projects. We weren't going to take on any new kids. We weren't going to take on any new staff. I was just going to look after the staff and kids already in my care because that's been responsible. And I'd just come up with this incredible master plan. You know, I'd I'd written it all out. I was going to word it in a a way that didn't sound quite so lacking in faith. But anyway, that was my master plan, to be wise and responsible. And all of a sudden, I received a phone call from one of our team in Pakistan. The joy of being boots in the ground is we get to be right in the middle of the midst of slavery and wandered labour. The downside of that is we are face to face with brutalities every single day. And so I received this phone call to say that a three year old called Mercy, well, we named her Mercy to protect her family, but three year old had been raped and murdered. And her body was just left on the floor of the big brick factory because, well, she's just a girl and two, she's just a slave. And so her body was just left there like a piece of, of garbage. And when you get a phone call like that and you just made your great master plan, I got that phone call and I remember just feeling sick in my stomach, thinking how in the world could I ever look at Mercy's mum in the eye and say, well, after the pandemic's passed, well, then we'll help. Or, well, once my own circumstances in life looks a little bit better, well, then I'll reach out. And I just felt so challenged to my car that sometimes even in the middle of our own pain, now's the time to still keep saying yes. And the yeses don't always make sense in our own thinking. It didn't make sense to extend our work in Pakistan in the middle of a global pandemic where we were losing donors. That makes no sense. 
But I remember thinking, okay, I either trust God or I don't. And I sensed the Holy Spirit was in it. It wasn't just a good idea. I really felt this prompting of the Holy Spirit. And so in the year of 2021, we doubled our work in Pakistan. At that point, we were working in 24 brick factories. We now work in 50 brick factories, going and doing Sunday school every single week. But we also doubled the size of our safe house. So we built a whole second floor out of 50 grand that we didn't have and built a whole second floor to the safe house to enable us to take in more kids. So we now have 85 children in our safe house. Mm. But it was all because of a phone call that challenged me to my car. But instead of being overwhelmed and retreating of this is too hard, God, we have a choice in those moments of leaning into Jesus and saying, okay, I can't do this, but you can. Or we can choose to retreat. And I'm thankful we chose to lean into Christ because now watching the kids that we've been able to rescue in the last 12 months has been amazing. And furthermore, as a result of some of those kids, we've come into contact with families that we've been able to help out of Afghanistan as well. Um, and so I ended up working in a whole arena that we didn't think we'd be working in as well. Similar, I guess, to you guys. Well, when the pandemic hit, um, we took one scripture Help us to know the signs of the times and what to do. Yeah. And th that was our mandate the whole time. From 1 Chronicles 12, 32. 1 Chronicles yeah. 12, 32. What are the signs of times and what do we do? And like you, we we doubled everything. We, I mean, in in the two years, we've now reached, we're now reaching over 70 nations, is it? Or something like that mm. with, with things God had given us. In all our travels, we had... Uh, actually gone to over 40 nations and so yeah, it, so we reached more nations during the pandemic than we did in the 30 years of traveling before wow. it. <laughs> and i think wow. too you know i really think we cannot be controlled by this pandemic yeah we cannot let the pandemic tell us what to do and what not to do I, i'm not talking about breaking the law when we don't have to break the law. I yeah. mean, I'm, I'm not doing that. But I'm talking about in our mentality and in our thinking. And we have seen crazy miracles that have allowed us into nations and out of nations when we legally weren't allowed to and we couldn't go to. And if we just looked at websites and everything, we wouldn't have moved. Yeah. Um, but God did it. And... and I can't, it's it's like uh, the book of Acts unfolding yeah. in front of us yeah. and, and us being able to walk in that. So while COVID is horrible, I mean, I'm not minimising COVID by by any means. While, while it's awful, it's also an opportunity mm. if we frame it that way. Yeah. So again, I think we identify with you in lots of ways and, and it's... It's it's amazing to see what amazing to see what God will do. Absolutely mm. amazing to see what He'll do. So, I was going to say, um, with the growth that you've just had over the last couple of years, um, what's next? So we are focusing heavily on ending exploitation. Um, and so there's two areas that we're massively running in. One is extending our work in Pakistan. We want to continue pulling kids out of slavery. I can't quite believe that in 2022, we can even still be talking about slavery. This just blows my head. This is something William Wilberforce was fighting generations ago. And yet here we still are still fighting the fight. Um, and so we want to massively extend what we're doing in, in Pakistan. But then combined with that, we run an initiative called the Dignity Project, uh, which started from Kenya. I had two mums approach me in Kenya because their kids had gone missing. And I found out it was human trafficking. Kids in our own village were being trafficked. And I think when you find out it's happening on your doorstep, it suddenly becomes your problem overnight. And um, we did a lot of research and found out that girls were missing a week of school every month simply because they didn't have access to sanitary products. And so period poverty very much feeds into human trafficking.
trafficking because girls were being targeted when they'd finished primary school. Young girls, nine, ten year olds were being targeted with these job opportunities. Come work for me in the city, be a cook, a cleaner, a nanny. And because they'd missed so much of their education, they'd missed a quarter of their education due to period poverty. So because they couldn't go on to secondary school, they were taking these job opportunities thinking, oh, brilliant, I can provide for my family back in the village. And then these girls are taken to the city and then taken, goodness knows where, as they're trafficked into a, a life that they did not choose for themselves. Daniela um, does a lot, has been involved with a lot of that in Thailand. Wow. Um, and, and exactly the same story. I mean, it's the same DNA everywhere. Um, there they even have t cases where um, if the family doesn't have a girl, they will choose their prettiest boy and give them a sex change at the age of seven or eight and send them off. But William Wilberforce, does that give you something to say, Andrew? Just thought. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, there's a lot that could be no, said. No, but, but I mean, you're a trustee. Well, yeah, I'm a trustee of a place that was connected to Wilberforce and the Thornton family and the, the whole Clapham, uh, how Clapham sect here, uh, wow. close to where we live. Mulgahanger um, Park, have you heard of it? I've not. I've not well, I'm when sorry. you come and see us, we'll take. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> um, do you, so you were just going to, you were going on to say something else, I think. Oh, sorry. No, no, you're okay. You but okay. The, the, they're the two areas we're wanting to run in. So, so far okay. we've reached about 20,000 girls, look, 20,200 and something girls with the Diggings Project. And so we want to extend that throughout the brick factories in Pakistan as well, if we can. And so that's our big sort of challenge that we're running within this next year. Okay. So for people listening, um, the websites, uh, links, all in the description box, go check those out. Uh, if you feel like supporting, then then do that. Uh, Becky, thank you so much. I know today has been crazy for you. Uh, people listening thank don't know what's been going on, but it's been madness. So thank you, thank you so much for, for being able to carve out a slot. Um, we really appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you for listening to this episode. If it inspired you, please rate us and subscribe on Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify or another podcast platform.